Hello, I'm Dr. Daniel Estgarden, a cardiologist who specializes in the treatment of heart rhythm disorders. You've been referred to Fletcher Allen because you may be a candidate for an implantation of a defibrillator. We refer to implantable defibrillators as ICDs, which stands for Implantable Cardioverter Defibrillator. I would like to use this time to explain to you what an ICD is, who may be a candidate for an ICD, what to expect the day of your procedure, and what it's like to live with a defibrillator. A starting point for anyone having a discussion like this is, well, do I want one? Um, in medicine, in the, in the way that we, in the modern uh, practice of medicine, the way that we do it nowadays is we use sets of data to tell us whether or not a treatment benefits people uh, broadly speaking. So we study large populations of patients for a given treatment, and if a treatment is effective, then those patients will either feel better over time and or they will live longer over time. Defe defibrillators in a very specific set of patients have been demonstrated to prolong life in many patients. So who are those patients? Well, those are people who for one reason or another, mostly, uh, are patients whose heart muscle has weakened. The most common cause for weakening of the heart muscle is related to coronary artery disease. So patients who have had, for example, heart attacks in the past or who chronically have blockages of the arteries of their heart, well, the heart muscle can get weak. And if the heart weakens enough, the heart becomes susceptible to developing dangerous electrical rhythms. And if one is to have one of those rhythms without having immediate access to medical help, then one could succumb to one of those electrical rhythms. One could die from such a rhythm. What a defibrillator does is it's constantly monitoring on a beat-to-beat -beat basis the heart rhythm. And if the heart rhythm suddenly becomes abnormal, the device will detect that abnormality and will do one of two things. In some cases, it can actually pace the heart back to a normal beat. Um, and if that happens, sometimes a patient might not even feel it. Or alternatively, if the an immediate problem is too dangerous or if the device fails to pace the heart back to normal, then the device will actually shock the heart. And by shocking the heart, this tends to be a very dramatic event. So patients who remember getting shocked will say, yeah, doc, I, I felt like I got kicked in the chest by a horse, is the most common phrase people use to describe it. The difference being that, as opposed to when you get kicked by something, you have continued pain. After getting a shock from a device, there is not continued pain. Patients often are confused about the relationship between a defibrillator and a pacemaker. And the simple way to think about it is that a defibrillator has all of the functions of a state-of-the-art pacemaker device, but has an additional function, which is the ability to deliver a shock to the heart if the heart should develop an unstable electrical rhythm. The pacemaker functionality of the device is really sort of a backup function. I can't tell you that you have to get the device. All I can tell you is whether or not you are somebody who, according to the definitions that we've yielded from looking at, you know, looking carefully at data and studying people over time, I can tell you whether or not you're someone who fits into a group of people in whom it has been proven that these devices can prolong life. The decision as to whether or not to actually get it is a highly personal one. And the way I like to think about it is I think of it like getting an insurance policy, for example, you wouldn't want to drive your car without an insurance policy because if you get in an accident, well, then you're liable to pay for the entire uh, repair of the car, for example, or the damage is done to another car or person. Uh, the device is the same thing. On a moment-to-moment -moment basis, it's not going to make you feel any better, but uh, uh, except for in the sense that uh, you will feel a little bit comforted potentially by the fact that if you have a dangerous electrical rhythm in your heart, well, you basically have like an on board ambulance crew living inside your body constantly monitoring your heart such that if you had a, a dangerous rhythm it would likely get you back to a normal rhythm so that you could go on and seek medical attention i.e. it could save your life now there are patients who come to me who will say well look doc I'm, I'm 96 years old uh, I've got uh, a bad uh, medical problem let's say they have lung cancer or something but they also have a weakened heart muscle and technically meet the definition of somebody who could get a defibrillator. And in that patient, I would say, well, again, you know, this is a personal decision, but I think it would be entirely reasonable in, in your case not to elect to get such a device. On the other hand, I have patients who are 45 years old who have had a heart attack, 
who are now at risk for sudden cardiac death. And I tell them, yeah, so this device is, is something you're going to have to live with for a long time, but there's a very good chance that the device could save your life, and there's a lot to live for in your case. Uh, so it totally depends on the individual uh, as to whether or not getting the device in the first place is appropriate. And while I'm always happy to have the discussion with the patient as to whether or not I agree with their personal assessment, I will never tell a patient what to do. The way that the device is implanted is through what we consider to be a minor surgical procedure. And we distinguish in our minds between minor and major in that in a major surgery, typically you have to cut through bone or to open up to get into a body cavity. A defibrillator, everything is done through a small incision in the skin just below the clavicle, typically on the patient's left side. The left side is preferred for defibrillators because it turns out that uh, that's a better side for delivering an effective shock to the heart to get the heart back to a normal rhythm. There are patients who are left-handed who would prefer to have the device placed on the right side, but in most cases, I uh, would recommend against that because it may compromise the functionality of the defibrillator. The way that the, we do the procedure is that the patient uh, typically will come in the morning of their procedure to the hospital at Fletcher Allen and after being registered and getting intravenous lines placed, etc., we bring them into our operating room where the patient is then anesthetized. And the way that we use anesthetic agents in this setting is we use something called conscious sedation, meaning that the patient gets fentanyl typically and Versed, which are medications that essentially make the patient not feel any pain and make them feel quite sleepy. Typically, the patient will be sleeping through the procedure, but we can talk to the patient essentially wake them up to make sure they're feeling okay throughout it. The way that the implant is actually performed is that there's a vein that runs underneath the clavicle. We enter that vein after having obviously cleaned up the skin and covering the, the body with sterile sheets. We enter that vein using a needle and through that needle in a series of steps ultimately we're able to simply place an electrical lead that extends underneath the clavicle through the vein down into the right atrium and or right ventricle of the heart. Ultimately, the important portion of the defibrillator circuit is the lead that sits in the right ventricle. The lead or leads are then connected to a defibrillator device. This is a typical example of a defibrillator, which have gotten quite small over the years and fit quite comfortably underneath the skin on the patient's body. Now, some patients have big chest walls in which case you can barely see such a device. Other patients are very thin and it's very easy to see the contours of the defibrillator device underneath the skin. The incision is closed with sutures that will dissolve in your body. It is then coated with either a surgical glue or a Steri-Strip bandage. If we use the glue, you can shower the next day. With Steri-Strips, the incision needs to stay dry for at least a week. Getting back to the procedure itself, after the device is implanted, we test it to ensure that it can effectively detect and treat a life-threatening arrhythmia. During this portion of the procedure, you will be under general anesthesia. Once the procedure is completed, you will be admitted to the hospital overnight, where you will be closely observed to make sure there are no complications from the procedure. During the overnight stay, you will also be receiving intravenous antibiotics to decrease the possibility of the device getting infected. Depending on the type of device you've had implanted, we may obtain an additional x-ray on the morning following the procedure. In all cases, we test, otherwise known as interrogate, the device using a computer that communicates direct with the defibrillator using radio waves. The computer allows us to confirm that all the electrical circuits are in place and functioning normally. After this period of observation, you'll be discharged home.